So there is one thing about having communism in China or Marxism in China is that a, a, a Marxist revolution or a communist revolution sort of talks a lot about seizing control of the means of production and the industrial proletariat. And China didn't really have those sorts of things. As with Russia. Uh, even less than Russia. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even less than Russia, yeah. In a book called Mao Zedong and China in the, in the 20th Century World by Rebecca E. Carl, she writes this, quote, A theoretical and practical paradox immediately emerged with the founding of the CCP. Marxist revolutionary theory calls for the working class, the proletariat, to lead a social revolutionary movement to overthrow capitalism and seize state power. Yet China in the 1920s was an overwhelmingly agrarian society, with only small pockets of industrial manufacturing, dominated by Western and Japanese capitalists located in the coastal treaty port cities. The question immediately presented itself, how were Chinese communists to reconcile a revolutionary ideology that presumed an, in, an industrial social structure with the reality of Chinese society, which was composed primarily of impoverished peasants? Who was to lead this revolution, and against whom was the revolution to be targeted? Uh, Rebecca Cole sort of suggests that China and communism were uh, something of a mismatch. Uh, she carries on to say, quote, The question at its most abstract, as well as at its most practical, became, how could a national Marxist revolution be mobilised in a country that lacked the social elements of a Marxist revolution and its central state apparatus, and where foreign imperialism played such enormous but uneven socio-economic and political roles. This was the theoretical, political, social and cultural dilemma that any Chinese Marxist and communist revolutionary faced. These issues were not taken up in systematic theoretical fashion by Chinese communists until after 1927, and yet they lurked behind the, pra the practice of all revolutionary mobilisers through the 1920s." End quote. So yeah, that's an interesting thing to take into account as well, that the, the type of communism that China actually ended up with I, after 1949, with the ultimate victory of the, of the communists, was its own thing. It was Maoism. It wasn't just uh, sort of Marxist-Leninism. It wasn't Stalinism. It wasn't... It, it was what Mao thought up. Well, it can't, I'll, I'll get to it a bit later, but it's actually called Marx, uh, Mao, Maoist thought. Right. Or, um, that's actually its proper name. <laughs> like, North Korea's got its own juche as well, hasn't it? Right. I don't, I don't know much about that, but. That's developed even further away from proper communism, I think. Right. Or when you say proper communism, like, that which the common turn decides is. Well, uh, with North Korea, right I think there's a lot, there's a big nationalistic element to it, and also, they kind of have a royal family as well, don't they? <laughs> North, well, the Kims. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, some sort of. There's no crown, but... Yeah, they're not strictly regnal, but... No. Uh, yeah, it is like a, a, a royal family, though, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so Mao, um, in 1921... By, by 1921, he's back in his... Back down south, in his sort of home province. He gets married to his... Often called his first wife, but it's not strictly his first wife because he got married when he was like fourteen, didn't he, to that woman very briefly. Uh, but what they say is his first wife. He got married to her, and she seemed to really love him and uh, was felt herself extremely proud that he deigned to be with her. <laughs> and they had a couple of kids, a couple of boys, but ultimately he left her. Yeah, the the, the details I've never really read anywhere or seen in any documentary, any real details about exactly why they split up or why he... Well, he went away to do his work for the party all over China, and she decided to stay. Uh, they, she was pregnant She was pregnant with their second boy a couple of years after 1921. She decided to stay. She asked Mao to stay, and then he said no. <laughs> so again, I've got more important to, things to do. Sim another parallel with Stalin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Mao had quite a few kids in his life and uh, was never really particularly warm to any of them. Well, some just gave away and never saw again, but I'll get to them as they come up. <laughs> yeah, around 1921, uh, Mao is helping organise unions uh, for sort of mines and railways, that sort of thing. Um, and he's got two younger brothers who are not as well read as him, uh, but they help out. By 1923... Mao is, is invited to be a member of the Central Committee in Shanghai, which is the highest 
uh, body of the party. So the party is still really small. There's only like 200 odd members or less. It's nothing like what you, you know, it doesn't, the, the Chinese Communist Party doesn't immediately have millions of members or anything. Um, Padres. <laughs> yeah. And sort of official Chinese Communist Party history would like it to be that Mao was there from the very beginning, but he wasn't. It wasn't until 1923 that he was invited to be in the, uh, the, the very highest committee. On the 7th of February in 1923, there's a, a big massacre. The forces of the government, the Republican government, decide they're going to crack down on their enemies. And they do, and there's a big massacre. I mean, it becomes known as the February 7th massacre. Um, there's a few of these. Um, they're quite often known as the, the date that they happened on. So there's one like on the 30th of May, a different year. Um, I think there's one on the 4th of May. So, and they, they, you know, if you're not really careful, they sort of meld into one into your mind. You can't remember which one's which, but there's definitely one on the February the 7th, 1923, which uh, sort of destroys all the progress, the small amounts of progress Mao and the party have made in the South. It's just come in and everything's smashed up, you know. Um, so a lot of communists are massacred or sympathisers. Yeah, yeah. However, it's funny that the, the Russians, the Bolsheviks, give their backing to the government called the, uh, the, the quite often called the GMD, the nationalist government, sort of the CCP versus the GMD. So the nationalists, the GMD and, and the communists decide to uh, work together. The Russians sort of decide to back the GMD, perhaps because they're actually um, an actual power on the ground and the communists were sort of nothing. They were tiny. Uh, but, and they were somewhat anti-imperialist. And, well, yeah, basically the Comintern, the Russian communists, see some tell them. the Chinese communists to fold themselves in to the GMD, just to become part of the one big party. Sort of okay. thing. Um, and no one's happy with that, <laughs> obviously, because uh, the nationalists, that they really want to fight the capitalists, the foreign capitalists in China with capitalism. They, you know, want to start industry and business of their own and and build up wealth and industry and fight back that way. Whereas the communists obviously just want to destroy everything. Uh, just just destroy it, like in- including Chinese culture, not just the foreigners that are there. So it's, it's an uneasy that's a foresh- alliance. It's a foreshadow of Pol Pot again, isn't it? What is, sorry? Destroy everything. Mm. But so yeah, I, they're they're told to they're told to go along with the GMD, and 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 this sort of makes Mao really disillusioned because, uh, as I said, he left his wife for party reasons, went up to Shanghai, um, in sort of 1923, leaving his wife and two little boys, and he said something in a letter. I, I just want to put away like the thoughts of of the thoughts that lovers have. I just want to put them out of my mind now and just, and that's it. And she didn't have anything. She couldn't do anything or say anything about that because he just did whatever he wanted to do. But but Mao is really disillusioned by this because he realises, you know, fairly quickly that there can be no compromise ultimately between communists and, and nationalists. And so, yeah, he come, becomes a bit disillusioned and uh, sort of eventually, uh, well, after Sun Yat-sen dies in 1924, he goes back home and he's just sort of in, uh, it's been variously described as sort of semi-reclusion. He's like not really involved in many things, not really writing any articles. Just for like a year or two, or a year or so, just sort of goes quiet and just uh, just a, the, what, the the last really quiet period in his life. Yeah, that's what happens. It, by 1925, he starts organising peasants again because in 1925 there's a sort of a wave of protest in the 4th of May and I think the 30th of May as well. There's massacres again. I think the 4th of May one particularly because um, that becomes like a byword, you know, like remember the 4th of May. And and anyway, yeah, there's just like a wave of protest basically across China in 1925. Nearly 2 million peasants are sort of mobilised against landlords and warlords because when when, when Sun Yat-sen dies, the, the small amount of authority he had been able to hold together sort of crumbles apart and you, we start really the period of the warlords where, as it suggests, there are sort of uh, regional warlords and there's no one central authority that's able to control them all. De facto autonomy. Yeah, basically, yeah. 
all inland because most of the coast is controlled by foreign interests. But but the, this the, this wave of protests is cracked cracked down upon really harshly, and Mao has to flee to uh, Canton all the way down in the south, uh, really far south, as far south as you can go, nearly. And it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, Chiang Kai Shek who emerges as sort of the, the the main power or one of the most powerful warlords, um, sort of in the central south areas of China. Yeah, so he, like Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek are sort of the main, because I'm not going to mention loads of people's names because they're difficult to remember who's who and they're hard to pronounce sometimes. <laughs> but if they're a really important character, I will say their names. So. so yeah, Chiang Kai-shek is um, a, a warlord, a badass warlord. And he, you know, he, he lives and dies by the sword and he realises that it's, the thing he's got to do is uh, try and consolidate power and take over more warlords. You know, it's it's them or him. And try and unify China. Yeah, of course, yeah, if you he's can. He's sort of a nationalist. Oh, yeah, he's definitely a, a nationalist, yeah, a republican and a, and a, and a military man. Yeah. So he launches his uh, so-called Northern Expedition, and that is to take his armies, GMD armies, north and see if he can take <laughs> more power for himself. The the GMD, Chiang Kai-shek's GMD, and, and peasants, a lot of peasants followed him, fought for him, versus the warlords. During this time, uh, Mao is working in Canton for the Republicans, basically, for the for like the Chiang Kai-shek government. He's, he does a job where he sort of uh, is like <laughs> known as... Um, I suppose, a, a champion of the peasants. He writes things and talks a lot about and gets a reputation for being a champion of the peasants because he sort of is one, you know. He's a well-read and his family weren't dirt poor, but he could make the case that he was, you know, from peasant stock, I suppose. He dressed like a peasant and things. So that's the sort of reputation he's getting for himself. But as Chiang Kai-shek and the Northern Expedition gets further and further away, Mao is sort of less needed and less interested in it and and it is successful the northern expedition ultimately he does Chiang Kai-shek does get to Beijing and install his government as the main government of China it takes years before the rest of the world really recognizes him but they do ultimately so he's sort of him and his faction the GMD faction are um, important from here on out it's basically the the government of China if you like even though there were always some warlords that were never completely under his control. And the real picture is a little bit more complex than that. But So it's by 1926 that Mao first really talks about peasant revolutions, specifically peasant revolutions um, in his writings. Because peasant revolutions are, are actually contrary to, to Marx and like, Russian communism, Leninism, yeah. And the GMD, they don't talk about that particularly. It's about the industrial workers. Marxists and Leninists always tend to see the peasants as like deeply reactionary, <laughs> especially the slightly more prosperous ones. Right, yeah, sure, exactly, yeah. So um, Mao is sort of turning it on its head a bit. And um, they're right to see it that way as well. Peasants will not make a communist revolution. They like their bit of land, you know. Especially in Russia, apparently they're like, like a a religious attachment to what land they've been granted, apparently. I can believe that, yeah. Yeah, like, it had been granted by the Tsar on the authority of God, you know. <laughs> and to be swept off their land was, like, the utmost, like, terrible thing for them. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, Mao's idea were more that he would take land off of landlords and give it to peasants. At this stage, anyway. <laughs> well, in 1926, Mao writes this, quote, a revolution is not like inviting people to dinner or writing an essay or painting a picture or doing embroidery. It cannot be refined so leisurely and gently, so benign, so upright, courteous, temperate and complacent. A revolution is an uprising, an act of violence whereby one class overthrows the power of another. A man in China is usually subjected to the domination of three systems of authority. The state system or political authority the clan system, clan authority, or the supernatural system, religious authority. As for women, in addition to being dominated by these three, they are also dominated by men, the authority of the husband. 
These four authorities, political, clan, religious and masculine, are the embodiment of the whole feudal, patriarchal, ideological system and are the four thick ropes binding the Chinese people, particularly the peasants. And it's funny that that language is a bit more familiar to us than it might have been 10 or 15 years ago, talking about patriarchal systems and stuff. I mean, that particularly does sound like something someone might say today. Mao would have been a progressive yeah, of his time. that's sort of what I'm trying to say, yeah. <laughs> well, it wasn't actually until 1927 that Chiang Kai-shek actually reaches um, Shanghai and is able to take it. But it, it's in 1927 that he makes a big decision, and that is that he can't abide the communists anymore. Uh, the dude can't abide. Good for him. So he unleashes what some people call the white terror. There's lots of white terrors in history. If you go on Wikipedia and do the disambiguation, there's, there's, I think there's like 10 or more. In the Russian civil war, obviously the white forces terrorized their population. There was like a white terror in Spain. There was one in Hungary. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Uh, In the Spanish civil war. Yeah. Um, It's like, there's loads of bloody Sundays, aren't there? (laughs) There's loads of them. Um, Whenever there's a massacre on a Sunday, it ends up getting called (laughs) bloody Sunday. Yeah. But anyway, this white terror, on and off, lasts until the the communists ultimately win in 1949. So it's over 20 years long. But there are hiatuses within it, notable ones. But um, yeah, nearly a a million people die in this white terror, all in all, I've heard it said. It, it, it forces the CCP very nearly to extinction a couple of times, especially early on, because there aren't even that many of them early on. And it sounds pretty brutal. Like the, He would hunt down communists wherever they were found and have them murdered like on, on the spot, killed on sight, if you were a known commie. Uh, Just treated as outright enemies of the state. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the things was... Uh, Communist women were easy to spot because they cut their hair short. So quite often women that had their hair cut short, whether they were or weren't an actual communist, were um, sort of hounded, maybe even tortured or killed. Mao, along with all the communists, really, um, have to sort of flee to rural areas to, to even attempt to survive. And that is what Mao does. Um, every, everything has to go underground, it's, uh, yeah, they're being hunted like animals, basically. And this is one of the bleakest periods for the Chinese Communist Party. It's sort of the, the darkest hour. All would have seemed lost, probably, at that point. Um, and, and the next few years are taken up in sort of re-establishing themselves and um, trying to set up bases out in these rural areas and trying to win over the hearts and minds, if you like, of peasants and things like that, which they do quite successfully some peasants like you know are interested in it and others uh, just simply hate the gmd government um so it's like a de facto you go along with the communists because they're gonna at least that's a point <laughs> yeah or the promise that they will give you land and it does seem that the communists did actually try to like, make some schools and things like that try and get some peasants to read which you know hadn't really been done before so there are definitely some elements where if you were a Chinese peasant in the late 20s and the communists had taken over your area, it might actually have been quite clearly in your interest to, to back them. And you haven't got a history of communism gone wrong to look back on either. No, right, exactly, <laughs> yeah. And the promise is out of Russia that um, it's all singing, all dancing, the poor people are all sorted out under communism. That's the word out of out of Russia. And Which even quite a few journalists and stuff in the left, believe, in, in the West believed as well. Yeah, well, you've got some uh, socialists that still believe it today. Yeah, but no, um, a lot of people, I think it was, is it uh, Malcolm Muggeridge went to British. Stalinist Russia in what, the 30s or late 30s? He went there and he reported back that it was a police state. Um, oh, right. oh. And, uh, and, you know, people like George Orwell and people that were actually truthful with themselves realised that... It was terrible. <laughs> yeah. And uh, everyone that closed their eyes to that could go on being communists, pretending Stalin wasn't a monster. But um, it was known 
that it was terrible, but not in China, not this early, no way. Yeah, these um, were peasants who'd never been anywhere. And yeah, and you're only told by other people that are that are already commies. <laughs> yeah. They're going to give you a, a rosy picture. Well, you can see why it's appealing. Yeah. In the summer of 1928, the communists and the GMD have a battle. Um, there are lots of battles, actually. But one of these battles, um, there's a, a, a verse which Mao wrote. Lots of Chinese people write poems, just write verses, especially back then, all the time, just over anything. And some of Mao, lots of Mao's survive. To give a flavour of it, here's one about that battle in the summer of 1928. Quote, At the foot of the mountain, our flags and banners can be seen. At its peak, our drums and bugles are heard to respond. The enemy troops besiege us, thousands strong. We stand alone and will not be moved. Already our defences were like a stern fortress. Now do our united walls form yet a stronger wall. The roar of gunfire rises from Huang Zhongjie, announcing the enemy has fled in the night. End quote. And of course, that sort of thing is just used as propaganda. People will be expected to remember it off by heart because Mao wrote it and all sorts of things. So over the next few years, um, the communists sort of re-establish themselves and the, uh, the Republicans try and destroy them if they can. Uh, One time they send 100,000 men against them and the communists are able to defeat them. It seems through um, mainly guerrilla style war, you sort of let your enemy come really far deep into your territory so that their supply lines are really overstretched and then you can sort of pick them off. And attack their supply lines. Yeah, yeah, and it takes them ages to turn around and get back and by that time sort of tactically or strategically they're they're beaten and they were able to do this three times the second time the government sent 200,000 men and the communist peasant guerrillas were able to beat them the third time they sent 300,000 men same thing again now in 1931 the Japanese invade Manchuria which is in the north the far north of China and which Russia covets it as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Used to, at least. Well, everyone covets it because it's a really resource-rich area, and later it's sort of definitely the most industrial right. area. Uh, so Chiang Kai-shek has to decide whether he wants to keep trying to wipe out the communists, mainly in the south, or whether he should try and stop the Japanese in the north. And basically, he decides on a policy of not really engaging with the Japanese. Whether he calculated that it would, wouldn't be worth it, or, uh, or I think usually they say that he his calculation was this, that the communists were more, more of a danger, <laughs> even more of a danger than the invading Japanese. <laughs> but that didn't go down well with the Republicans, his base, um, all the nationalists. They're not... They, they didn't want... They, they were aghast to see the Japanese invade, you know? Their ancient enemies. Yeah. And were the Japanese, like, overwhelmingly powerful compared to China? Basically, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they'd been industrial for decades. And, you know, they, they were able to beat the Russians in a fight. And they so, dealt with the West a lot rather than just getting whooped by the West as well. A bit. I mean, they were quite... They were very isolationist. Right. But, yeah, they well, would. They, bought, you know, they would, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. They... They would. Um, and didn't they have a close relationship with Germany by this point as well? Yeah, yeah, and they would build um, sort of modern ships, for example. They would see the latest designs by the the British or the Germans or the Russians and uh, copy them and try and make them better and stuff. So, and they beat the Russians in a naval war not not too long before this. So they were a modern force. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So Chiang Kai-shek's in a dire situation. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, the, yeah, he's caught between two pretty implacable enemies. But he does have control over the Chinese state. Yeah, as as was. Yeah, 